Father, we, we thank you for all you've given us. Our lives, our families, this church, but most of all, your word. Your word which brings all things into being. Lord, may your spirit move on the word. May your word dwell richly in our hearts as we lay them open before you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've passed through another Groundhog Day, and the rodents have spoken. Overall, it's looking pretty good uh, for us here in the northeastern corner of, of North America. Ontario's own Wyarts and Willie and three others have predicted an early spring. Something I, I can believe a bit, given what yesterday looked like, but today the sun shining through. Oh, and yes, apparently Nova Scotia does use a lobster for this kind of thing. Um, and honestly, I have to admit, I didn't even know that most, most of the Wyarts and Willies so far have been albinos <laughs> until I looked this on this handy infographic on the Weather Network. That's because I don't normally pay too much, uh, no close attention to whether a burrowing rodent sees its shadow on February 2nd. Though after the last month of near total darkness and gloom, I'm really hoping those furry little guys got it right this year. But the main reason, the main reason I'm drawing your attention to Groundhog Day this year is for its other meaning. And that comes from the 1993 movie starring Bill Murray. It was such a popular film and has become such a cult classic that you probably know what it's about even if you're like me and have never actually seen it. A cynical weatherman has to cover the Groundhog Day uh, celebrations in rural Pennsylvania and is not too happy about it but somehow gets stuck in a time loop where he has to live the same day over and over and over again. Which means there's a good chance that if you hear someone refer to it being Groundhog Day, there's a good chance they're talking about a sense of deja vu, or that it genuinely feels like you've been living the same day over and over again like we all did back in 2020, or like the disciples in our story from the Gospel of Mark today. The feeding of the 5,000 is one of Jesus' best known miracles. The feeding of the 4,000, on the other hand, just leaves a lot of people feeling a bit puzzled as to why it's there. In fact, you'll find plenty of Serious Bible scholars struggle with this one and come up with, from at least my perspective, some pretty unsatisfying explanations for why Mark and Matthew, for that matter, include both of these very similar stories. But I tend to agree with those who think Mark, and indeed Jesus himself, is trying to show us something very important in doing the same thing twice or rather what looks like the same thing twice, because there are some important differences between the two events and what they mean in the big picture of Jesus' ministry. The first of these differences is easy to miss because it has to do with context and knowing a bit of ancient geography. If we go back a bit into chapter 7, Mark gives us the setting for the feeding of the 4,000. And it's in this purple area to the southeast of the Sea of Galilee that's called the Decapolis, that is the Ten Cities. This is a non-Jewish or Gentile area, in contrast to Jewish Galilee, where the feeding of the 5,000 happened. The earlier sign was for Jews, people of Israel, this one is for the wider world. We could go more into that, but that's for another day. The next difference is a bit more obvious if you put the two stories side by side. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me, not one day, but three days. 
Remember, the feeding of the 5,000 happened at the end of one day, teaching and healing. Jesus, on the other hand, feeds the 4,000 after three full days out in the wilderness. Now, one common way, and the difference in this makes is, is will become clear in a second, because one of the common ways of interpreting the feeding of the 5,000, especially by modern Western readers, is that Jesus' example of sharing inspired the, the people in the crowd to share their bread as well. Read this way, the lesson of the story is that God gives us everything we need, and all we have to do is share, and everyone will have more than enough. And there have been plenty of sermons preached on this interpretation in the last hundred years or so. And it is one perfectly valid way of looking at the feeding of the 5,000. I would say it's definitely one of the meanings contained within the text. But it doesn't work here for the feeding of the 4,000. Because this crowd, again, has been with Jesus here in the wilderness for three days. Even the most prepared individual, group, or family how many of you have either a super mom or a super dad who would always have food with them for more than you needed? But you would run out after three days. And this is what the text says twice, just in case we're not paying attention. There is nothing to eat. Indeed, Jesus points it out himself to the disciples. So what happens here is unambiguously miraculous in a way that the feeding of the 5,000 is not. This is clearly more than natural. There's no other way to read it. This presents us with a deeper challenge, definitely as modern Western people. I am someone who believes that God does sometimes work in ways that are more than natural that miracles do sometimes happen. Not always, usually not often, and we should definitely investigate carefully to make sure that it is genuinely a miracle. But all of that being said, even with the, the, that asterisk, I know that this is something that is very difficult for many, if not most people, to accept in our context. We are rational, scientific people, or at least we, we tell ourselves that. And if that is you, I encourage you to sit with that discomfort and difficulty, because I know I still feel it too. I grew up with the naturalistic worldview of our culture. Even as I've come to believe that God can still work in this way, should he choose. And perhaps in this tension, God is challenging us to be more open to the incredible variety of ways He is at work in this world and the powerful things that He can still accomplish today. Indeed, no matter what we believe about miracles in the Bible or miracles today, I hope we can all see that these stories point to the ordinary ways that God works every day. We see God work in extraordinary ways that highlight what He does in the ordinary. One of those things is how God provides for us. We can miss it so easily. And stories like this one, like the manna in the wilderness, remind us of that because they are so extraordinary. Indeed, it is so easy, it is so easy for us to feel like, hey, we provide for ourselves. I look after me. Or my community looks after me. Human beings, we look after ourselves. It's just as easy to think that nature randomly provides for some, not for others. Either way, we paint God out of the picture when we fall into these mindsets, whether consciously or unconsciously. But the deep reality taught by the full story of Scripture is that God is the one who provides for us, full stop. 
It all goes back to God. Everything we have is a generous gift from the God whose compassion we see in the face of the Jesus who says, I have compassion for these people and for their needs. God provides, God is reliable, and God can be trusted. Which brings us to the final and most obvious difference between the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000, and that's, well, it's the second time that Jesus has done this. And as we all know, it's different when something happens the second time from what happens the first time. Mark notes this at the beginning of the story, and if we miss the significance of this, he highlights it again in the follow-up narrative that we heard also of another boat ride across the Sea of Galilee. Now, after the intensity and chaos of another day of ministry, the disciples realized, as we heard, they only had one loaf of bread in the boat. So when Jesus speaks to them metaphorically about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, well, they take it as a passive-aggressive dig about their planning capacity. And now, but really, they, they should know that um, Jesus always knows what they're thinking, what they're saying to each other, even among themselves. So Jesus says, why are you talking about having no bread? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how, how many basketfuls did you pick up? Uh, Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many pieces did you pick up? Seven. When Jesus is in the boat, you don't have to worry about bread. I mean, we are meant to see the ridiculousness of this situation. Again, if, you're, if you've been with Jesus for both, you know what he can do. Indeed, why would you ever worry about bread again? And yet here are the disciples doing just that a couple of days later. Because they're human. Because they're human like you and like me. We find it so hard to trust that God can provide and that God is reliable in that provision. Now, a big part of it is because, yeah, there are so many things in this life that seem so random and so unreliable. Who gets sick and who does not? Who grows up in abundance and who grows up in scarcity? Who lives a charmed life and who seems to face tragedy after tragedy? And another part of this is because it does so often seem like we can control whether we have enough or not. That we can provide for ourselves if we work hard enough. Aren't too much in the hole when we start, and if we're lucky. Or not too unlucky anyways. And those last two are more important than most of us acknowledge. But we do have this sense that we can, if we work hard enough, we can provide for ourselves. Because... There are things that we are able to provide for ourselves. And so we find it easier, in our own minds, safer to rely on ourselves rather than rely on God. Yet in this, we miss the obvious in the same way the disciples in the boat miss the obvious. In the midst of the many, many things in this world that are unreliable, we miss the infinitely more important things that are incredibly, miraculously reliable. Like the rising of the sun. Our very existence, life on this blue planet with our yellow sun, the right distance away, the right temperature, life on this planet is a miracle, statistically, Incredibly unlikely in this vast universe. With every sunrise, with every breath of air, every drop of rain or flake of snow, 
everything that grows from the ground, year after year, we are given what we need for life. And we do nothing to earn it. God has given us more than enough abundance here for life to thrive and flourish. And yes, as those many sermons on the feeding of the 5,000 point out, there would be more than enough for everyone if we could truly learn how to share. Now this also comes down to trust. Trust in God. He'll give it to us on a communal level. And trust in our neighbors for us to be willing to part with it and also, or rely on others to provide it. And this trust, it is so hard for us to learn which is the main point of the feeding of the 4,000 and the stories that follow. God provides, but we struggle to see it. God provides and we forget what he just did five minutes ago. So he works wonders to get our attention. And because we struggle to see and hear, God does the same thing more than once. He also does this to remind us that our Creator, our Sustainer, our God doesn't just act once and then leave us to fend for ourselves. He provides for us again and again, day by day, month by month, and year by year. He shows us this. What God has done once, God will do again. Our God is reliable, and in Jesus, He is here in the boat with us now. So why are we still talking about having no bread? The good news is that in Jesus, we can see that our God is here with us to open our eyes, if we'll let Him. And as I've said before in this series, Mark is like a good movie director. Rather than tell us the point, he shows us. Immediately after challenging the disciples here about their inability to see, Mark gives us a rather unique story of Jesus healing a blind person. And it's unique in that Jesus has to make two attempts to fully heal the man's blindness. It's, there's nothing quite like it. He has to do it twice. And the reason for this is the symbolic role it plays in the overall narrative. It's why we've been reading these really long gospel passages, because the stories and the order they're put in a mark are so important. Understanding takes time. Faith and trust take time. And the good news is that Jesus is patient and doesn't give up on us if we don't get it the first time around. If we are open to his healing, he will lay his hands on us again and again, until our eyes are open. If, again, He will heal us, He will open our eyes, He will help us to trust if we're willing to just stay there with Him and let Him lay His hands on us as many times as it is necessary for us to be healed and to see and to trust. And so, we can not only know that what God has done he, once, He will do again. Or that what Jesus has done once, He will do again. That we can learn, and with His help, come to trust this. And when we trust it, it changes how we live. A life lived with trust, with faith, is so different than one lived without. I know that myself. I've watched it in my, my parents' lives, particularly, um, 
I've shared this before, my father is a man of profound faith. He's taken risks during very difficult seasons of our life where I know both my mom and, and I were wondering, can we really give that money away? Can we put it in the offering plate? Can we give it to that charity? Dad always believed that if we trust, God would provide. Sometimes it takes a long time, did in our story. But when we trust, we can even enter into God doing something remarkable again, as we talked about last Sunday. But again, if, if we're having trouble seeing, if we're having trouble trusting, then number one, Jesus understands. He has compassion for us. And number two, he can help us get there in time. We just have to take the plunge and ask God to help us trust that he will provide. We've been doing some of this together as a congregation over the past couple of years. Just under two years ago, those of you who were in the congregation at the time made the decision to trust that God will provide, to continue with full-time ministry when our financial situation was very challenging. And then, within months, God provided us an opportunity. Cornerstones. They're leaving us. They left us this Friday. If you go downstairs, it looks pretty empty right now. But God brought them to us when we responded in faith and put ourselves out there, trusting that He would provide. And in the same way, over that year and a half that we've had cornerstones with us, we'll see in the annual report, not only did we have phenomenal rental income last year, but we also had the highest giving any time in St. Andrews in anybody's memory. God provided, and God also opened hearts and added people to our community. And as we go forward, I know one of the challenges has been there we have all kinds of, there are amazing ideas that have come up out of this New Beginnings process. I know one of the things that is weighing on some of us is, well, we can come up with ideas, but how are we going to be able to do them? We can trust, again, if we step out in faith, God will provide. Indeed, God may provide before the faith is there. He often does that. And again, this is true for us both personally as well as our life as a congregation. Is there a place for you or where I need to trust? To maybe even step before we know we feel we have the trust to take that step. I want to tell you today that we can. Because God is reliable and God is trustworthy. And he'll help us get there. Jesus will lay his hands on us and we will see and trust and walk by faith. If we'll let him. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.